centipedes have about a thousand legs, but actually Millie has about 250 legs. So not as many as you think. Now Millie is also blind. So can you see her big antenna there? So she can't, she can only see light and dark. And then she has to feel with her antenna, feel around a bit like blind men sticks. So she needs to see where she can go. Oh, I like the butterfly background there. There's some very creative people here with their backgrounds. Really nice. Isn't do you it? know, I've never worked out how to do any background. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm still working out how it works. Um, so yeah, so these live in Africa. And um, as Mark said as well, they look a little bit like a big poo sometimes. When they're quite scared, they curl up. And um, that's one of the ways they protect themselves. Right with the hand in, with the head in the middle. And it goes in their favour because no one wants to eat poo. So no. if you look like poo, it's very unlikely someone's going to try and eat you. Um, so it goes in their favour. Yes. Um, you have to be a little bit careful with these with water as well because they can't swim. They haven't got um, they haven't got any lungs very uh, like us. So what they have, they have above their legs, they have got some little holes where they breathe through. And they're not allowed to get them wet in the water because otherwise they will drown. And you can Very see cool. as well, the legs go like a Mexican wave. So she's quite fast. Very cool, isn't she? That is very cool, guys. Any questions? We've got a question here from um, Facebook. We've got lots of people watching on Facebook. Um, oh, the yes. question is, um, does, um, does Millie make any noise? Good question. No, they don't make any noise other than if she falls and her skeleton is quite hard. Let's see, uh, makes a bit of a boring noise. <laughs> yeah. but but she, uh, no, it, it's, her legs are so teeny tiny. It's literally like someone just gently tickling you. Uh, but they've got quite a good grip, so it's very hard for them to fall because even if most of her body is off of you, she can just hold on with the end. So she's very clever, much cleverer than me, I think. Yes, lots of people also think they are, um, uh, um, what's the other one? Centipedes. Centipedes, yes, yeah. sorry, blank here. Uh -huh. um, the centipedes are flatter and they can be venomous, they can bite. Yeah. The good thing with millipedes is they can't bite. No. Uh, and they're not venomous either. Centipedes. Centipedes generally are very pretty compared to the millipedes. The millipedes are always one colour, um, quite quite boring in, in colour, but um, centipedes are, are very bright and very colourful. But yeah, they come with a nasty bite. So yes. give me the millipede over a centipede. We have yeah. quite a few questions at the moment. Um, Go on then. Uh, Maya, what's your question? I can draw I can't, on can't hear you yet, lovely. Wait till you're unmuted. Muted. Is yes. she um, an adult or a baby and how old is she? Good question. So Millie is, oh, uh, Millie is about two years old, yeah, I'd say two now, roughly. Three. Yeah. And um, they can live up to about five to seven years. And she is probably almost fully grown. They yeah, don't get bigger. much bigger than this. They can get up this. to about 30 centimetres at the maximum. Um, so one of your rulers, a 30 centimetre ruler, that's as long as they're going to get. But she, I would say she's pretty much, she's pretty much fully grown. She's, she's, she's not going to grow an awful lot more. No. Any other questions? We do. We've got Ooh. Lola. What's your question? Hello, ladies. How long is it? How long are their legs? Well, that's Ooh, a pretty good small question. Leg. I would say they're about a centimetre long. I was going to say about yeah. a centimetre, but maybe not even. They're not very long. They just go in a little bit so she can really hold on. Any more questions? Got one last question. Here we go. Yeah. What do they eat? Oh, good good question. question. I was just going to say that because millipedes are really important for the rainforest in Africa. Because, um, you know, when you've got vegetables or you've got fruit and when you don't eat it on time, it gets all soft and sometimes it gets a bit hairy as well. And that's what she likes to eat. So she makes sure in the rainforest, if all, if plants or fruit or anything Leaves. dies or if it's not right anymore for the rainforest, then she will eat it. So she's basically 
a hoover in the forest to yeah. make it all nice and clean on the floor. So it's a well, rainforest again. vacuum cleaner. Yes. <laughs> Even when a lion, for example, or a tiger would eat, well, not a tiger in Africa, but like a lion um, would eat the meat from an animal that they killed then she can start eating the bones because she needs some calcium as well to make her nice exoskeleton. So um, she even cleans up the bones of the lions. Yeah. Very, yeah. very helpful. Great. Yeah. Do they have ears? Oh, yes, Good question. Wow. Wow. Well, these questions are amazing, aren't they? They're, 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 they're um, stumping me. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if they do. They haven't got ears, have they? No, they no. haven't got any ears. <laughs> um, so they're blind and deaf, basically. But they can feel through their legs. They can feel the, feel the movement. So if someone would... Yeah, the, the vibrations. Sorry, yes. And so if someone would walk past her or near her, or not even that near, actually, she can feel the earth, earth uh, move a bit, the vibrations, so she knows something is coming, and she'll quickly go into a round uh, spiral. Any more questions? We've got another one here from Facebook. Um, just to remind everyone on Facebook, if you do want to ask any questions, make sure you leave a comment and we'll keep an eye on them. Um, but this one is, um, are they dangerous? They're not dangerous no. at all. I would say millipedes, giant millipedes, make really nice pets, actually. They're very easy to keep, just a tank with some soil and a bit of heat. And, and they eat all your vegetables and fruit that you can't eat yourself anymore. And you can give it to them. So uh, they're not dangerous. They're really fun. And they're really easy to look after as well. Yeah. All right. So I'll show you the next animal. So we stay in the bug world. And we're going to go a little bit yucky now. Because this is Stella. And Stella is an African giant land snail. Look at that. So she's got four tentacles. She's got two that are her eyes. And the bottom two are two noses where she can also feel things with. So they're also feelers. Now, Stella is quite small and um, she's also a rescue one. And you can see her shell is not in the best state. It should be all nice and brown like this, but it's a bit white, which means she didn't get enough calcium to make a nice shell. Now, I say Stella and I say she. But snails are actually really interesting animals because all the snails in the world are hermaphrodites, which means they're boys and girls at the same time. So if you have two snails together, you can always get babies, which is quite cute, you think. But if you've got two snails and they're going to lay eggs, they're not going to lay two eggs no. or five not or even ten. 100 not even a hundred they lay about 200 eggs, so you'll have 200 baby snails. And we did. And we this did. one, as I said, <laughs> Stella is quite small. They can get as big as my head almost. Uh, they can get really, really big. So imagine to have 200 giant snails. You need a very big tank for that. And lots of vegetables as well, because yeah. these eat all the time. They love to eat lots of lettuce. And, cucumber, uh, cucumber, potato. dandelion, um, and you need to feed them all the time. Now, we always oh. say there's two. Oh, yeah, go on. Sorry, is there a question? Oh, Nola's got a question. Let's quickly go to Nola. What's your question, Nola? Do you want to unmute yourself? Um, how big would you say the, um, the shell is? The shell? Oh, the shell is about. It's like a small hand. Yeah. Like a clenched fist. I think if you put your hands out like that, I think that's how big it is slightly. My hand is quite big, but your hand's probably a bit smaller. So it's probably as big as your hands almost. But they can get Much quite a bigger. bit bigger. Yeah. So this is only a small one. She's like a teenager. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Any more questions? I think we're okay, but I'm loving Maya's background at the moment. It's looking amazing. She's got an I love snails. Yeah. Yes, she's been very creative. Maya, are you a graphic designer? <laughs> Sure. Not, not yet. Not yet. Is. Not yet. Not yet. I think um, there's a question from Simon's sisters. I don't know who. Oh this yes. Hello. Is. There you go. How hard is it to break a shell? How hard is it to break the shell? Well, the shell is quite hard, but it's quite easy to break, and especially the side here that's closest to the body, because that's where it grows. So every time the shell grows. Uh, she makes a little new ring here. So this, this bit is very soft. 
This is the hardest bit, but it's still quite easy to break. So if you would squash it, it's easier than an egg, basically, yeah. isn't it? So you have to be quite careful. She can't, if she would fall on the floor, it probably breaks. And that's not very good. But she needs a shell because it's part of her body. Good question. Maya's got a question. Maya, there you go. Do you want to unmute yourself, Maya, quickly? <laughs> um, is she fast or slow, like for a snail? Ooh, for a snail, well, for a snail, she's very fast. <laughs> yeah. But uh, <laughs> now, snails are one of the slowest animals in the world. Um, so, no, she's not very fast. You can easily keep up with her. Um, I'm slower. Yes. Is there anyone that would be brave enough to hold Stella, though? We always say there's two ways of holding her. So, if you're a little bit scared of the slime, you can hold it like this, like an ice cream. But no licking, okay? Because the taste is disgusting. And um, if you're very brave, you can also fall to flat on your hands. But it might get a little bit slimy. So who's going to be brave enough to hold her, if you could? Maya. Maya, Maya is very brave, isn't it? Nola as well. Excellent. Um, it's quite nice. You know what some ladies do as well when they go to a spa? They put it on their face because mm. apparently it's very expensive. It's a snail facial. And the moisturizer that they give off, it makes you much younger. Obviously, we don't use it because we look old. What do you think, Beth? <laughs> yeah? <laughs> I can see she's um, thinking about it. <laughs> Not my news. I'll, send my it, news. I'll send a couple over. Yeah. <laughs> I'll call you. I'll call you. <laughs> <laughs> right. There. Yes. If I... Oh, I need to oh. that over. Sorry. If I take that. Uh, next animal, then. So we go to some reptiles next. And can you see him when I need to get down? Oh, he's running off straight he's away. He's seen the screen. He wants to be famous. Here we go. Let me put it down a little bit so you can see him a little bit better. So this is Ozzy. And Ozzy is a bearded dragon. Now, bearded dragons are one of the coolest and friendliest reptiles uh, in the world, basically. They're from Australia, so that means they're really chilled because everything from Australia is really chilled. And um, you can see as well, he's quite greedy. Well, he likes to eat. He likes to eat some worms. Um, they're alive, and it's very good for him to have a live insects because uh, it's a bit of enrichment, which is something that's really important because our animals are all uh, in captivity. They don't live in the wild, so we need to keep them busy and we keep the we reptiles. Keep brains active. Yeah, we keep them active by giving them live um, animals sometimes, not animals, insects. Um, well, reptiles, reptiles won't eat dead insects. Uh, they need to be alive for them to eat them. Uh, so it's very important that they have live food. It's pretty disgusting, uh, but it is essential to keep them alive. Yes. Now, why do we call these beard dragons? Because uh, they've got a really cool beard. And like all of us are going to get a beard, even the girls. So they've got a little beard under here. Um, and then when he's angry or stressed, or upset, or really excited. Or excited. <laughs> this will go really black, and he'll bob his head up and down, and he'll get really, really angry. Uh, but he's never done it. Ozzy is one of our rescues that kind of had a little bit of a, a horrible history. When we collected him, he had some of his tails being burnt off, and most of his toes, except one on the back, have been removed. Uh, so we don't know if that was from another reptile or if someone removed them themselves. Uh, but he, he was he was not great. He was in poor health, but he's made a full recovery. And uh, he's probably one of our happiest animals, don't you think? Yeah, he is. Because the thing is with bearded dragons, <clears throat> they're so friendly. And um, because they're so friendly, they need to do something to protect themselves. So what have they thought of? Just to look really scary. And that's why they've got the beard. But also, now, also, he doesn't really have to make sleep, but normally they've got big spikes in the side as well. But those spikes are soft like hairs. So they just look really scary, but they are very friendly. Yeah. It's all about the show with the bearded dragon. We've never met an unfriendly bearded dragon, have we? Never. No, they're a little bit grumpy sometimes, but they're, never, we they're never dangerous or anything. No. They have an off day uh, if they haven't had enough sleep or haven't had enough food, but uh, like humans. Um, but no, they're always really friendly, lovely, sociable animals. They love attention. I think Maya has a question there, Maya. What's your question, lovely? Wait Maya, till you. She loves lizards. Let's unmute you. Oh. Um, how big is the dragon? 
we think he's around six or seven. With rescue animals, we don't always know their age because sometimes they've had a few different owners before they come to us. Uh, but we think he's around six or seven and they can live anything between 10 and, and 15. But around 10 is kind of like a, a good age for a bearded dragon. Yes. So he's middle-aged. You had another question, lovely? Oh, you answered that there. I was about to ask how old do they live Perfect. for. Okay, cool. uh, Nola then is next. Um, um, how big is he? How big? You, so li you like to know about sizes, don't you, Nola? <laughs> <laughs> Very important. <laughs> next question, I'll tell you the size yeah. right away so you don't have to ask. Uh, so, ask. you can see his body and head fit onto my hand, and then the tail goes down here. Now, as I said, he's had some of his tail removed. Uh, it's, it was burnt off, so it would normally be a little bit longer, like an yeah, inch or two longer. Like. Normally, the, the length of the tail is the same size as their body, and uh, both of them are about 10, 15 centimeters. So I think he is about the size of a ruler, but maybe slightly bigger. Actually. And he's he's, um, a, he's an average size for a bearded dragon. Yes. We have we have one that's larger than him, and we have two that's smaller than him. Excellent. Any other questions about our bearded dragon? Mr. Osley. No. Have you finished with the Perfect. Lines? So we move on to our yes. snakes. So, are you feeling brave? I have got two snakes here. Let me put Ozzy away first, because we don't want any of the animals out with the snakes. Where is the lid? Right there. Oh. Um, I'll have him. I'm going make him. Let me put this away. Oh. Okay, so we've got two types of snakes here. We've got corn snakes and oh, <laughs> and a royal python. So this is uh, Freddy, and Freddy is a royal python. So they come from Africa. It's a lovely black color with gold as well, and that's why they're called royal pythons. Uh, has to do with their color because the royals in Africa used to use them as um, clothing or uh, accessories, yeah, bracelets. Uh, Cleopatra was well known to have uh, royal pythons as uh, accessories. And um, that's why, why they got the name royal python. Now, royal pythons are quite chilled. and um, Very chilled. Yeah, they're very relaxed snakes. And he is fully grown, Freddy. So Freddy is about just under one and a half meter. And... Uh, all he can do is get a bit fatter because royal pythons are quite small snakes in length, but they can get quite fat. Now, over there with Mark, we've got Mavis, and Mavis is a corn snake. And corn snakes come from oh. America. <laughs> oh, there you go. Why don't I take that and yeah. take this one? So they come from America and they're. A longer snake, so he, so for Mavis, is just a bit longer than Freddy. She is just over a meter and a half, but she is a lot thinner. So they don't get that fat as a, a royal python can. Careful with the yeah, no, no, it's okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, so she's, she's actually quite big for a corn snake. They're normally a lot uh, thinner in, in their density um, and not quite as long. So she's she's a big girl for a, for a corn snake. We thought she was a python when we first uh, rescued her, uh, but no, she's definitely a corn. Yes, um, I've lost her here. Um, Hello, baby. Now the corn snakes are very useful. They help people in America because they grow a lot of corn there. Sweet corn, for example, you can have them and. Um, Sadly, the rats and the mice eat the sweet corn and then we can't have it anymore. So what the people do there, they put these snakes, these uh, corn snakes in the fields with the corn to eat all the rats and mice. And then if they have the rats and the mice, they're happy. And then we can have the sweet corn instead of the rats and the mice. And then we're happy. Now I see Nola is very excited about this snake. <laughs> question, guys. Um, how do you get all the animals over to England? Like, how does that happen? They're all bred in this country, apart from well, um, one, wasn't it? Um, yes, our, the, the skunk, skunk. Our skunk was bred in Ireland, 
all of our animals are um, captive bred. So they're all animals that have been bred for the pet trade. And then generally people become bored with them or they lose their jobs, move house, situations change. Sometimes the animals have been abused. Uh, lots and lots of different stories. Uh, but yeah, they've all been captive bred in this country apart from one. Yeah, so when I say Mavis comes from America, Mavis actually doesn't come from America. No. Her species come from yeah. America. All right, sorry. Yeah, it's not it might have been confusing. <laughs> <laughs> um, any other questions? Um, I think the Simosis has, has a question over here. I've got two questions. Two? Oh, go on. Go, go on then. Do they bleed? Do they bleed? Yeah. Wow, oh, good I question. I really wasn't expecting um, that. <laughs> you know what? You stunned me there. I don't know. I think they would, actually, because they've got blood in them. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I guess they would bleed. I've if, never, um, never seen one. Um, I imagine no. they can... The thing yeah. is, normally the snake makes another animal bleed because yeah. they attack them. They're predator, aren't they? Their skin so, is um, very, very thick. I, it would take a really good bite to puncture. I have to say, we had one snake that was a bit poorly, and we had to inject her with uh, medication. Was it twice a day? Mm -hmm. And um, although we had to inject her, I never saw blood actually. No. But, I think uh, because their skin is so thick that it's a long way for the blood to come out. Yes. What's your other question, lovely? Less gruesome, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> you said you had two questions. What was? Yeah. How much scales do they have? Wow. A lot. You know what I'll do? I'll take a photo and I send it to you and then you may be able to, to, count, uh, them. to count them for me. Because <laughs> every time I get halfway, I'm losing count. It's so <laughs> difficult because he moves all the time. They so have a lot. They got a loads lot. and lots of scales. And the good thing is, at the top, her scales are really, really smooth. It feels really nice. At the bottom, her skills are a bit harder and they can come off the body a bit so she can move herself forward. Good question. Right, Nola, next question. Yeah, don't let her ask any more no. questions because we Gosh, don't know the answers. difficult. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, Nola. Um, um, are uh, um, why are snakes being hunted? Good question. So they're being hunted for several reasons. Some snakes are being hunted because um, they like the people that live in their country like to eat them. Yeah. Um, sometimes snakes are being um, hunted because they really like their skin because it is very pretty and they want to make clothes or uh, shoes or bags of them, which is quite sad because we can make skin like this and we don't have to kill an animal for oh, it. No. Um, so yeah, there's different reasons. Sometimes they kill a snake as well. Um, just because they're scared of them. Because they're scared of them, yes, and they're in the wrong uh, place and if, people want to get rid of well, them. Well, the problem is if snakes are coming into your village um, and killing your animals, obviously that's a problem. Um, so then they can be killed for that as well. Did you like um, me telling how long you, they were, Nola? Was that all right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so you didn't have to ask. Good second <laughs> question, though. Uh, Maya, what's your question, lovely? Wait till you're unmuted. When they're a baby, how big are they when they first come out? Oh, teeny, teeny. Oh, they're teeny tiny. They're like a worm. Yes. Skinny. How long does it take for them to grow? Um, about they a year. Most of them they're growing in the first two yeah. years. But uh, they grow for a few years till they're really long like this. So Maeve is about 12 years old and Freddie is about was he six? Uh, five or six now. Yeah, five yeah. or six. So it um, takes a few years for them to fully grow, but most of the growing happens in the first year. Yeah. First two years. We've got a question here from Rory. Rory, what's your question? Um, so do a lot of people uh, abandon animals due to the size they grow to? Like they do, the snakes start off really small and then they yeah. think Some of all of a sudden really, it's really big. A Burmese, a Burmese python can look like this when it's young, uh, but it gets up to 20 foot and very, very thick. 
So a lot of, and we've got lizards that have grown to say four or five foot and they yeah, pull them when they're teeny, teeny tiny. And it's it's not so much the size of the animal that makes people abandon them, it's the size of the enclosure that they need to build. One of our enclosures for one of our lizards is six foot by six foot by three foot, which is a huge enclosure it's to have in behind the, these yeah, banners behind here. It. Uh, but it's <laughs> yeah. a huge enclosure to have in like a normal living room or bedroom. It would take up most of your bedroom. Um, so yeah, I think people they love the animal when it's a baby, um, and then size takes over, and then the food becomes expensive, the vet bills become expensive, the heating and the electricity. So yeah, I think people get a little bit bored of them. Yeah, that's why it's really important when you want an animal, they do lots and lots of Google, research Google, Google. Um, <laughs> and think about it, think about it. And then we say as well, if you're going to have a certain pet for the first time, it's maybe a good idea to rescue them because then animals don't live as long as they're not like these live for about 25 years. But if you get Mavis when she's already 20 years or 15 years, you won't have them for that long. Uh, plus, they're already used a lot of the time to being handled. So you yeah. don't have to do all the hard work. You won't get bits and, so um, Yeah. And you can kind of try before you buy, if you know what I mean, <laughs> before you... Yeah, and it's for like really the nice whole to rescue. Time. It's really nice to rescue. Yeah. Everyone always wants a baby, but I think, do you know what? If you buy a baby animal, you're going to have to train it. It's probably going to bite you. Um, so I you think, the hard work. looking at the time, um, oh, do I need is to there me? more questions? Because we've got one more animal that we really want to show yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm going to get her out. No more questions? No? Right, let's put these snakes away. And then the last animal we're going to take out is uh, Mika. And Mika is one of those animals that you can have as a pet, but you shouldn't really. Oh, Nola, you got a quick question about snakes still? Well, um, I don't have a question, but um, snakes are one of my favorite animals. Oh, they yes. are, yeah. I used to be really scared of snakes, actually, but now I've got them. They are really cool. And they're such easy pets to look after as well, because they only need to eat once a week or once every two weeks so they don't need lots of food are um, they wild animals are they are they wild animals um i wouldn't say wild we don't train our animals so we're not a circus um so we like to uh like them to act as natural as possible uh, so sometimes they can be a little bit uh wildish but um to parties and schools, we only take the animals that really enjoy coming out and are really nice and tame as well. So it's not dangerous. Hmm? It's important that they can get to the vets. Yes, it's also important that we can take them to the vets. So we try to always make them um, tame enough to handle them. All right, excellent. So our last animal is Mika. And Mika, you can already see here on our banner, because Mika is a meerkat. Um, so C is uh, very cute and very tame, but meerkats are not the best pets to have because they've got incredible... Oh, she's seeing something that she's not agreeing with. What are you seeing? <laughs> so this is uh, the call she does when she sees something to alert. So she's telling you all to hide, run and hide, quick. It's dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're sitting here between all these animals and there's some chinchillas here on the side that she's never seen so she might be a bit um like well, I, think what? Uh, I think she saw the snakes when we had the snakes plus plus mark is putting the snakes away as well and snakes are one of the predators of the meerkats you're right lovely there's nothing there look. it's all safe let's have a look at the camera so um mika is very special see um uh, was a baby when she came to us. She was only about five, six weeks. And um, what happened with her, she had two brothers or sisters. There were three of the babies. And um, the mum was really, really scared. And when mums of Mia gets get a bit scared, sometimes they start eating their babies. So um, Mika's mum ate her brother and sister. And then she ate her tail, because you can see she hasn't got a tail. And... Um, Luckily, when she starts, let me just put this away. When the mom starts to eat the tail, the people that lived, she lived with saw that, took her away, mm -hmm. and um, she survived. But she hasn't got a tail, but she can still stand up. Yeah, so she's got a little stump. Uh, it permanently looks like she's having a poop. 
Yes, I see someone with a question. Rick, was it Rick or Ricky? Sorry. I, yes. <laughs> Go on, mate. Hi, guys. Um, first of all, it's been an amazing session. Um, Very well. The kids have absolutely loved it. But so have the grown ups. Um, well, the so called grown ups. That's what they call themselves. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I've been trying to work out whether we should call them grown-ups for ages. Um, no, but, um, it's been such an amazing session, and you guys, you guys are great together. Uh, you delivered, uh, you delivered brilliantly. Um, I wanted to ask because I couldn't resist whether your friend there can get me a better deal on my car insurance. There's, there's always, there's always <laughs> a man that has, has to ask that. It's never a woman. Always a man. <laughs> Generally a dad. How do I mute him? <laughs> Okay, I'll ask you a serious question. If we had you on again, do you have more animals that you could show us? We do. We do. So we've got, we said we've got about 100, 130 animals, but um, lots of the same, because when animals live in groups, we like to have a group of them as well. But we've got about 25 different species, so we definitely have more interesting lots of animals other different to show lizards, you. Lizards, uh, parrots, that sort of thing as well. Well, do you know what, guys? You will definitely hear from us. We can't wait to have you on again. Um, Thanks so much. It's been a great session. Back to you. Back to you. Excellent. That's right. You're very welcome, mate. Um, so, yes, we've got three meerkats at the moment because meerkats like to live in a group. Um, but sadly, we've got two living together. There's uh, Mika and Bonnie is uh, our alpha female because girls are the boss with uh, meerkats. Um, <laughs> boys not. Yeah. And we've got one boy, but Mika doesn't really like the boys. No. So we're trying Mika to make like them all... Boys live together but um she doesn't really allow us to there she goes <laughs> she was very to busy today it's because she wants to play it's also her dinner time oh you know what she probably yes. saw oh she might want some of these ones let me see if i can show you so what meerkats do they don't just eat normally they got massive claws and with those claws they um, dig normally for the worms or any other insects they want to eat and can find. Um, so their claws are not very sharp. Mika, stop showing them your bottom. Yes, he keeps going with her <laughs> bottom. Oh, there she goes. Um, and she makes quite a noise as well oh, while she eats. Mika. Oh, come here, baby. It's all right, it's daddy. It's daddy. There She's not a quiet eater. No. He's smacking away. Um, but... Meerkats are omnivores. They eat all kinds of things. So uh, they like the insects. So they have insects every day here. But chicken. they also like a bit of chicken, egg, um, eggs, some vegetables, vegetables and fruits. fruits. They love a bit of cucumber or banana. She would totally eat that snail if she could see it. Yes. And we've got a little harness on her as well. And that's because Mika um, is very, very friendly. But if we have to grab her sometimes, um, that's when she gets a bit scared because she thinks a predator will try to grab her. Yeah. And um, when so we say grab, give us a little she just, if she uh, if she jumps on the floor and we try to just kind of pick her back up, she doesn't like that. But with the harness, I know that she can't get very far because Mika loves to play, and she would still be playing at about two o'clock in the morning if we let her. Yes. Um, so Let's yeah, we just have pick to her up again. A little bit more oh, stricter let me. Mika than her. Just to let you know, guys, we're about to run out of time. We've got okay. just about two minutes. Yes. I hope you've enjoyed it. And um, I hope you've enjoyed meeting all our lovely rescue animals. Um, and follow us on social media. Yes, yeah, so we're on Facebook and uh, Instagram. Instagram as well, where you can see lots of other animals. And um, YouTube. Once we're <laughs> able to, we'd love to come and um, celebrate your birthday as well with the animals. And then you can properly hold them rather than... Yeah, we like people to them. hold our animals. Looking at them on, on screen is never as much fun. Um, do you have an age limit for the birthdays you're willing to come to? Like, can I bring you to my 28th really birthday? Young, All right. <laughs> young to adults. We've done parties for I've one year old. First, yeah, and a hundred. And a hundred year old. Yeah, everything. Um, and everything in between. Everyone um, we've got hen animals. parties, all kind of things. Yeah, weddings. It's just, we've got a few <laughs> animals that do have a age limit. Uh, because some of our animals have very big teeth and when you're really young it's sometimes quite difficult not to kind of get yeah, in their face you. and um, we don't teeth. want any bites so we do have a few animals like the meerkat that have a uh, an age limit of an age restriction i have to say so, yeah um so yes right hope you've had fun guys enjoy the rest of your evening and uh look after animals Yes, and we really like to see you back again. So uh, I'd say back to Josh.
Thank you very much. That was amazing. <laughs> yes. One of my favorite things about virtual GLGB is getting to um, learn new skills and have amazing experiences like this every day. So thank you very much, Jerry and Mark. Um, so now it's time to welcome our Acts of Kindness host, Tair. We have loved watching you guys get involved with our daily Acts of Kindness and are so excited for this evening. Hi, Tair. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm very good. Thank you. Yeah. That was amazing. I loved that. that was really good fun. I enjoyed that. I was that. like up here, like looking at them, trying to see. <laughs> so much fun. Um, so what we're going to be doing today with Acts of Kindness is a bit different. We're going to do a bit of arts and crafts because um, we didn't get to do that today. And that's one of my favorite things about virtual jail to be is that we get to do all these different arts and crafts and create different things together. So what I want you guys to go and get is a few pieces of paper. They can be used pieces of paper. They could be new, they could be colorful and have some pen around you or some markers or anything, highlighters, anything that you like to use, even stickers. Um, and then either like sellotape or um, one of these things, which I forgot how you call in English. Anyone help me out? And stapler. 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 That's the one. In Hebrew, it's called shadchan. There you go. Little Hebrew lesson. Um, or you could bring like even just like stickers, anything that you have where you can put like two things together. So I'm just going to give you a sec to go and get that. And then when you have it, we're going to be making a little chain of acts of kindness. Ooh, exactly, Louis Faber, thank you. I see the sound effects without the sound coming out. Um, <laughs> thank you, Bev. So I'm gonna wait a few seconds because I see some people left their screens. Thank you, great, Ben. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be making one of those, you know, those paper chains where they kind of link together. I don't know if you guys do this, but in Israel, we make them for Sukkot and that's how, like put in the Sukkot. Um, so I am a professional. And I have these little strips that are left over from Sukkot, so I'm going to use these. But essentially what we're going to do is on each one of these little strips, so if you have a big piece of paper, just cut it into strips. doesn't matter that they're the, they don't have to be the same width. They don't have to be the same length. Just You can even rip it. Um, and we're going to write different acts of kindness on them. So it could be either acts of kindness that you've already done, either with virtual JLGB or on your own, or it could be things that you are planning to do in future or things just that make you happy. You could just write them down or you can do a little illustration. I know what my first act of kindness is going to be and that's going to be an act of kindness towards myself. And that's going to be to follow our amazing animal world on any social media. So I get really nice meerkats every day. <laughs> I think that should be one for all of us. So just take your pen or your pencil or your whatever you're going to be writing with and just start writing on anything that you want. Does anyone want to share with us what they're going to write on theirs? Anyone, Ooh, think, anyone have any ideas? Oh, um, Mai, do you have an idea? I'll mute, mute yourself. You're muted. What's your good, um, you could do? Don't you? bully. Sorry, say again. Don't bully. Don't bully. That's an excellent one. Write that, and then I think put a little heart next to it because we want to love and not hate. Who Any other nice ones? Know? I'm going to write down making dinner for my family. That's really nice. What would you yeah. make for your family? I made um, pasta with tomato sauce tonight. It was very yummy. Very nice. Delish, yeah. Did you other, also like... help clear up? Oh, obviously. I washed up before and after, so. Well That's done. The full experience with you, who, isn't it? Who could, who could want anything more, genuinely? Anyone else? So, let me show you my first one. So I have a really nice garden at home that my mum loves. And the other day, it was a few weeks ago, I just planted some things before she came home. So she'll see really nice flowers when she came back. So I just made one with lots of flowers. That's lovely. So once we have two of them, I'll show you how to link them together. It's very simple. And I'll show you how you can do it with all the different types of like adhesives and stuff. Oh, that's very nice, Maya. Well done. Anyone else want to tell us what they're doing, what they're writing down on or illustrating on theirs? Yes, Louis Faber. I like to give out one 
com at least one compliment every day to make somebody's day special. That's so nice. Go on, give me a compliment then. Well, Tahir, my compliment to you would be you're doing a fantastic job tonight on GLGB Virtual and keep it up. We Thank love you. You too. You see, you made my day great. I hope I made yours too. I'll give you a compliment. Your hair looks great today. You're muted, but I saw you say thank you very much. I did say thank you. <laughs> I'll tell you, you know what? While we're doing this, let me tell you something. I saw a video today about how to make your life better during, um, just in general, little things that you can change in your life that will make you feel happier. And I saw a thing where every morning you need to write down five good small wins about your day, about yesterday, or about your week. And I really like that because sometimes in life... We're getting deep here. But sometimes you say to yourself, oh, I need to do this homework or I need to do this, I need to do that. And then it's just, you, if you don't do it, you just feel bad. But that's not true because even if you spoke to someone today that you didn't speak to the other day, that's a small win. Or if you helped clear the table or made dinner for your family, or even if you just finished a TV show that you've been watching for ages and you finished the series, that's a small win there. See that? And that's a small win, so write that down in the morning. I think uh, so, someone... Diamond Sisters. You yes. Have... I made like a pet for the NHS. You made what for the NHS? Like, uh, a little present for the NHS. What did you make? I made like, there was a trophy I made, a little book, and I also made some wrapping paper out of old paper and I stick them together and I also made like a little note. That's amazing and you recycled. Well done. That's so nice. Did you send it out already? No, because I just need my dad to send it to everyone. But that's so great. Well done. You see, you can, are you making the chain with us or are you going to make it later? No, I already made it, but I'm just okay. going to make another one. It. so that's really great so let me show you i did another one i just put follow animals but i know what it means so once we have at least two of them what we're going to do is we're going to kind of link them together so one of them you're going to want to make a little circle out of it i might just turn off my virtual background so you can see me better great so we've got a little circle -y thing here what we're going to do is we're going to close it. So you can do it with your sellotape, with your stapler, or with a sticker, with anything, with some glue stick, anything that you want. So just make it into a circle. It could be like a, it's a bracelet. It's a crown. Guys, we're multitasking here. It's amazing. Um, and then we're going to take another one. What? Earrings. It could be, it could be an earring. That's very true. Just don't stay for your ear. Yeah, no, don't, do not staple your ear. Um, and then we're going to take the other piece. It's pretty straightforward. And you're just going to kind of put it through. And then you're going to close off this one. And then this is a m crazy earring, bracelet, whatever. So the more of these you make, the longer it would be. And not all of them have to have writing on them. That's really nice to see if someone already has three of them here. And then once you have a few of them, you could just put it somewhere you can either just um, hook it up to something. Yeah, that's really nice. Um, place it wherever in your house, just like that, dangling down. Or you can make a really long one and hang it from each side. See? As I took down my virtual background, you can all see my little Oxford Street sign. Don't know if you can see that. Another little um, acts of kindness slash positivity for you. This is my childhood bedroom. And I'm from Israel and I really wanted to move to London one day. And then I did six years ago. Dreams come true, kids. So, <laughs> so let's keep on doing these acts of kindness, writing down little things. Does anyone else want to show us or tell us what they can, what they're doing on their little chains or just tell us nice things that they've done recently? Let's have one more from Maya. Oh, his heart. Love that. I feel a theme going on with your chain. 
I love it. It's a lovely theme. It's all about love. It's like a train. So, <laughs> that is a mic drop right there, Beverly. Yeah. <laughs> One small act of kindness can cause so many great acts of kindness. Yes, it's exactly. a chain of acts of kindness, which is a chain reaction of uh, kindness and love and spreading that positivity all around. So you can hang it in your room or you can hang it in your sibling's room or in your parents' room to show them what you've done and kind of let it spread through them as well. So that is my message for you today of stay kind and help out wherever you can help out yourself stay positive stay happy stay calm <laughs> during this crazy crazy time um yeah and please send us whatever you're making on virtual jlgb we'd love to hear your stories and see all the wonderful things you're making go and follow um the lovely amazing world of animals page that we heard about before um and that's it from me for today i hope we'll see you next week and that's it back to you josh that was amazing. Thank you so much, Teir. And thank you, everyone at home, for getting involved with our acts of kindness. So before I introduce our special guest for tonight, I thought I'd just let you guys know what we have in store for you tomorrow. On Thursday, we'll be doing more arts and crafts with Rachel. I'm doing another amazing navigation skills club with Rory before talking to TV producer Ben Winston. What a lineup. But tonight, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce our special guest. Professor David Latchman, CBE, is a British geneticist, university academic, and chair of the Morris Wall Charitable Foundation, one of JLGB's major supporters who funded the creation of JLGB's Evolve Volunteering and Skills Initiative. Professor Latchman has carried out research and lectured in the area of molecular genetics for over 30 years after first obtaining his BA in Natural Sciences from the University of Cambridge in 1978. Professor Latchman was appointed as Master of, Bir Master of Birkbeck at the University of London on the 1st of January 2003. A vocal advocate, David has used his platform to improve access for adults to higher education through part-time degrees and evening courses, a specialty in which Birkbeck has quickly become a leader in. As such, he was appointed Commander of the British Empire in the 2010 Birthday Honours for Services to Higher Education. David is the nephew of the late Morris Wall and chairs the Wall Charitable Foundation, which gives millions of pounds each year to help support the whole range of Jewish causes, including the building of Jewish Cares Wall Campus and countless other projects throughout wider society, Israel and across the world. Perhaps the most interesting of all, Professor, all of Professor Latchman's uh, credits is the current chairman of the Maccabeans, an ancient order that JLGB members may have heard of, as it was a startup grant of just £25 back in 1895 that enabled Colonel Albert Goldsmith to create the Jewish Lads Brigade 125 years ago, better known today as our very own JLGB. So we have a lot to be grateful for. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our very special guest, Professor David Latchman, CBE. Good evening, David. Oh. Oh, there you go. Good evening, David. Good evening. Can you hear me now? Yeah, perfect. Good. Splendid. Good evening. We're, we're very privileged to have you on the show tonight. How are you and how has lockdown been treating you? Um, well, it's uh, I'm, I'm very well. I'm slightly intimidated by your previous items. I'm not sure that I can compete with the meerkat. Um, and I certainly can't compete with the chain making. Um, so I will do my very best um, to entertain you and whatever. Um, how am I coping with lockdown? Obviously, it's extraordinarily difficult seeing what's going on outside, um, trying to keep Birkbeck going, trying to keep the World Foundation going. Um, but you may be able to see behind me um, that I am a collector of Judaica and Jewish books. Um, and so I have been exploring um, my library. Um, and I'm reminded of the quote, um, King James I, when he visited the Bodleian Library in Oxford um, in 1605, 400 years ago, said, if I would have to be a prisoner, I would like this to be my prison. So um, that's, that's the prison that I'm in, um, but looking forward to getting out a bit more now that we're um, able to go out a bit more. Very apt. <laughs> so we're, um, we're really pleased to have you on our JLGB virtual program tonight. We've been boosting positivity and keeping children and their families active and healthy 
for 11 weeks now since lockdown with the help of a special guest help each evening. Um, why was it important for you to join us this evening? Well, I think I'm, an, I'm a great um, admirer of JLGB. As you said, um, I'm the president of the Maccabeans. Colonel Goldsmith, the founder of JLGB, was also a president of the Maccabeans. So there's been these long-standing links with the Maccabeans. I should explain um, for people that the Maccabeans is an organization of Jewish professionals that gets together to listen to speakers um, and so on. So I'm an admirer of JLGB. World Foundation, of course, has supported um, JLGB. And so it's really a pleasure um, to be here and get the chance to talk to you. Well, thank you very much for joining us. Um, so we're all about acts of kindness here at JLGB. Um, you saw Tahir's little presentation and it's the heart of our Evolve work, which of course the World Foundation helped to create. Um, we always ask our guests what they've been doing to help others. Is there a personal act of kindness which you've done to help others during this pandemic? Um, I think I've kept my wife calm, which is probably uh, <laughs> one of the things that I've had to do um, and you know, stopped her going out too much because she wants to run around. Um, but I think, you know, I, I suppose in terms of, of things I've had to do, running Birkbeck and trying to get all our courses online in a way that our um, older students can access, running the World Foundation where we've been inundated with applications from people who you know, are in difficulties and need greater finance and so on. So that's been keeping me very occupied as well. Okay, so if you don't mind, um, let's jump straight in with something many of our viewers may not actually know. Um, what exactly is molecular genetics? Okay, so well, molecular biology is really the study of DNA. Um, I'm sure you know DNA is the genetic material and molecular biology, the study of DNA, use of DNA in diagnostics, all those sorts of things. Molecular genetics is a bit more about um, how that DNA expresses itself. So for example, everybody in all the cells of your body, in your brain, your liver, your kidney, you have more or less exactly the same DNA. What differs is how that DNA gets read out. So what's made from that DNA in the liver is what makes the liver a liver. What's made from the DNA in the brain is what makes the brain a brain. And I spent a lot of time studying what's called really gene regulation. How does the DNA get expressed differently and read differently in different cell types? And that's fundamental to how we go from being a one cell fertilized egg to the multicellular um, people that we are. Right, okay. So you're clearly very well knowledge in it, obviously an expert, but um, way back when you were a pupil at Habs Boys, was science and academia always the plan? Uh, were there any other potential careers in store? Interesting question. I mean, my, my late father started off after he graduated going into the sort of academic life. Amazingly, he actually taught the, the Canadian army uh, maths by correspondence during the Second World War. So it wasn't online, it was, he showed me once these things that he sent out to the troops and they filled them in um, and sent them back. So he always wanted to be an academic. And I think then he got married and he had responsibilities. He went into property and so on as many Jewish people do. And so I think he inculcated into me that the academic lifestyle was the great lifestyle. Um, and mundane as it is, biology was my best subject at school. So I went into biology. I knew I didn't want to be a doctor of medicine, but so I went into the sort of the, the equivalent in terms of science. Okay, so it's always sort of something you've considered. Yes. Um, so with the coronavirus pandemic rightfully diverting research into studying the virus and its effects, um, how do you think this will impact important scientific research moving forward, either for the good or for the bad? Um, and has lockdown affected your own research? Well, I think it's an interesting question. And I think you know, to answer it perhaps in a slightly different way um, and to try and sort of get your viewers at something that I feel very strongly about, which is that I think during the EU referendum and after that, we saw a great fear of experts. People were not interested in experts. They had their own view and they wanted to express their own view. Now, I think we've seen exactly the opposite. We've seen people running to experts, desperate to read in the newspaper or online or whatever, what does this expert say and what does that expert say? And frankly, a lot of people who have um, professorships in areas that have nothing to do with the coronavirus have been giving out all sorts of things about the coronavirus, which frankly, they know very little about. 
Um, so for example, I better not give you too many examples, but there have been things in the media where you sort of sigh when you read it and it's hyped up in the media because you think actually this person is a cancer specialist or this person is a neurobiologist and they've been tempted to comment in an area that they don't really know anything about. So I think what would be much better is if they went back to their own areas of research and carried on pushing them forward because there is a parallel here with the health service where we read all the time that you know people are not going to the doctor, there will be cases of people who should have gone and been diagnosed, didn't go because they were quite fright rightly frightened. I think we'll see also that people have sort of diverted themselves from their area of research to do something different. And they might do better to stick to, to what they're doing and leave the specialists in virology to get on with this. Right, that's, that's quite interesting. Um, you, were, you were talking before about the sort of how we're, we're beginning to um, respect experts a bit more. Um, and I've heard, I've sort of heard it banded around a bit. Do you think this could possibly be the end of the sort of idea of anti-vax, the idea of sort of mm. mistrust in that? It's very interesting. I mean, of course, the anti-vax campaign has actually seems to have strengthened now um, in all this. And the people who are sort of leading that and people who have, you know, in the scientific community don't have a good reputation have emerged again saying there's no point in vaccination um, and so on. I mean, I think, you know, hopefully we will get a vaccine. Hopefully that vaccine will work. And I think people will then realize that, you know, vaccination is something that, that is necessary and protects us from these sorts of diseases. And, you know, the young people in JLGB, and I don't even remember either the sort of the main, you know, the, the scourges of infectious diseases like polio and diphtheria, you know, which affected many, many people, killing them or paralyzing them, have gone because of vaccination. So we need to get back the, the idea that vaccination is a critical element. Right. Okay, so um, how has lockdown affected your own research and your own work? Well, my main work, because I'm the head of Birkbeck, my main work really is the running of Birkbeck rather than right. research myself. And we have had to put all our um, teaching online um, for the spring and summer term, and we're planning for that in the autumn as well. And interestingly, we've had to put all our exams online. So some universities have abandoned assessments the way that A-levels have been changed into sort of the teacher assessing you. Many universities have abandoned that as well. We have not done that because we feel we owe it to our students for them to have the chance to show what they've learned. And very interestingly, in the exams we've had so far, which have been done virtually, there has been a greater take up of the exam by the students than there was when they had to come in and sit in an exam hall where some of them found it difficult to balance it with their work and so on. Mm -hmm. We've actually seen a bigger uptake of the, of the exams and more people wanting to sort of prove what they can do than, than took place before. That's really quite interesting. Um, do, you, do you think, especially because your um, Birkbeck is sort of about adult, adult education and sort of making that quite flexible, do you think that maybe what you've learned from adapting it for coronavirus could be carried on sort of even after lockdown's over? Yes, I mean, I think we, we will not go over to, to a normal situation to a fully online service um, because that's the province of the Open University, which does that very well. Yeah. What we will do, I think, is to learn the lesson of what works online, what can be continued online, and then what really requires face-to-face. -face. And probably a lot of the lectures can be online, a lot of tutorials and small group teaching to be face-to-face. -face. Because our students, because they're working during the day and studying in the evening, because everything is in the evening, they are very time poor. They have families, they have jobs in normal circumstances, have to go to work, they have to deal with their families even now, and of course, they have to study. So the more we can get them to be able to do it at the time they want to do it, even if it's in the middle of the night when the baby's gone to sleep or whatever, and the less they have to come into Birkbeck, the better. But I think there will always be a core of face-to-face -face in Birkbeck, which will be about people you know, gaining from working with others and gaining from working with the, the lecturer who's teaching them. Right. Okay. So um, could you maybe tell us a bit more about your, is it your uncle Morris Wall and his wife Vivian? Yes. Um, and how their lives live on through the wall legacy. Yes, so well, I'm very happy to do that. Of course, they, my uncle was a philanthropist. He made a great deal of money, um, but he believed that you had to give that money um, back 
and you had to you know, go back and give it to charities and so on. Um, an example of that in his will, he had a magnificent art collection. He left his art collection not to a gallery or to be set up in his name or anything like that. He left it to be sold by us, his trustees, and used to fund the project. And that's what funded the Jewish Care Building in Golders Green, which you, I think, referred to um, earlier. So that was funded from the sale of his art collection. Um, so he left a very big legacy in terms of um, supporting charities in the UK, in Israel, um, and in Europe. And we do our very best to continue that legacy by supporting um, charities across Israel, across Britain and so on, um, like JLGB, like Jewish Care, um, but also medical charities. And of course, now we are inundated with uh, requests for emergency funding and special funding. And you know, we've had to adapt ourselves and actually double our spending. Um, to continue that because we've got situations clearly where people who supported a charity can no longer do so. And in some terrible cases have actually become clients of the charity themselves where they gave to support poor families and now they need support themselves. So we really have to focus on those sorts of things. Now. Okay, so it's sort of, it's learning to adapt. Um, yes. Which is, you've actually answered my next question, which was sort of how, how are you adapting and responding to the crisis? Um, it's prioritizing, I think. You know, we're really, we're starting to say now, well, this particular thing, it's really got nothing to do with the crisis. Can it wait you know, for a year or two? This particular thing is actually about helping people in the crisis, helping people you know, who need support in whatever way. We need to prioritize that. So that's, that's what right. we're doing. Which is it's not what you want to be doing, but it's, it's more important now than yes. ever. Yes, and we've learned also not to, that we don't have to sit in the room together, the five trustees to make decisions, we can make them on Zoom. So we have been doing that as well. Okay, so we'll, um, we'll now go to our audience for some questions. Uh, we'll start with Georgia. Hi. Hello, hi. Um, so, sorry, I've got it written down. Um, so I've heard that you are an avid collector of like Jewish memorabilia and different things like that. And I was just wondering where like, your interest of collecting these things comes from. And I heard that you had some JLGB original memorabilia in your collection. And yes. I was quite excited about that. Excellent. Well, I'm very glad you asked me that since I brought things, um, or rather I moved them into a different place near the, near the camera. Um, so the first question about how I became interested, I think I was always interested in collecting. You know, and I think it's the collectors are born. You know, you want to collect something. Uh, it might be matchboxes, it might be beer mats, it could be anything. And I decided I was interested in Jews in England. Um, so my collection is really all about Jews in England um, and that I've been collecting for many years. Um, and that is, you know, the sort of part of that is, of course, JLGB, because JLGB is part of the history of Jews in England, part of the process of you know, evolving in an organisation that's changed. So I have brought a number of things, maybe a couple of things, so maybe I'll show them um, now. So one of them is a, a set of them around somebody who was a J Jewish lad, if you like, um, started off in the brigade. And this is a medal he won. Let me see if I can, I hope you can see this. Um, this is a medal he won and it says Birchington 1928. So that's from your camp in Birchington, Jewish Lads Brigade. I'm afraid lads and girls were separate then. Um, so this was a lads brigade. Um, so he won that in Birchington in 1928. Um, and then he actually served in the Second World War. Um, so this is his Africa star which he won, this is from the Battle of El Alamein um, and Tobruk, where they fought the Germans, Rommel, that you may well know about, um, across North Africa, gradually pushing the Germans back. Um, and then he became an officer in the JLGB, a captain after the war. And this one is particularly interesting to me because this is his long service medal, which is the Colonel Albert Goldsmith Maccabeans medal. So as Josh mentioned earlier, the founder of JLGB, and one of the leading lights of the Maccabeans. So that's just about that. And I'll show you one more thing, which shows you perhaps how the brigade has changed um, in your time. Um, so this cup is a cup that was given um, to somebody in 1911 um, from the London part of JLGB, and he got it for being the best shot so being the best rifle shot in the camp. So I don't think, I think Neil Martin told me that you didn't do rifle shooting anymore, um, but this fellow, and I don't know what happened to him afterwards. Um, so he went on, he won this cup for, for rifle shooting. So that's just a couple of bits of JLGB or JLB memorabilia. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to have 
words with Neil Martin later. I want to try my computing again. <laughs> um, we've next, um, we've got Bev asking a question next. Hi, it's lovely to meet you. And it's also really interesting to hear about the GLGB memorabilia. Um, so my question is about the Maccabeans. You are the current chair. Um, can you tell us about what the order actually does and also what you think our founder, Colonel Goldsmith, um, would have made of GLGB, GLGB Virtual and everything that the organisation has, has achieved in the last 125 years? Okay, well, I think, firstly, the Maccabeans. So the Maccabeans is an organisation of Jewish professionals. So we have, you know, people get proposed for membership, they get elected to membership. It really had its heyday at the time when there were not many Jewish professionals. So what it did, for example, let's say you were a recent law graduate um, and there weren't that many, say in the twenties or thirties, you would be invited to dinner. You might find yourself sitting next to a Jewish judge or the attorney general or whatever it might be. So it was very much a networking organization at a time when most Jews were in business rather than in the professions. Um, it now continues as a sort of nice dining club. We listen to um, speakers and so on. Um, we had uh, last time, last so we have a Hanukkah dinner because we have a Hanukkah menorah that was designed by our first president, famous artist, Solomon J. Solomon. Um, so we have a, um, a regular Hanukkah dinner um, and we had um, one of the Jewish labor MPs about a week or two before the election speaking about Corbyn um, and her view of, of Corbyn and what was going on. So that, so we still have sort of those sorts of um, topical um, things. Um, well, now, Colonel Goldsmith, of course, I don't know how much you know, but was an extraordinary figure, somebody who was brought up as a Christian um, and discovered that he was Jewish, came back to the Jewish um, faith, was involved with the Maccabeans, involved with JLGB. I think, you know, his his mantra and the mantra of the people at the time was the book that you know about, I'm sure the centenary history of JLGB, a good Jew and a good Englishman. And it was designed you know, to make immigrant Jews into English um, people who could hunt and shoot and do all the things um, and get medals for it. Um, very different, JLGB is very different today, of course, but I think he would be very keen on you know, the idea of the volunteering, the Evolve program. And I think he'd really like the idea that you know, everything has adapted to this sort of online thing. I do reflect, you know, there have been you know, serious diseases over the years. You know, if you read in the 1660s, the account of the plague when Jews had just returned to England, you know, people were dying in the way that they were in what we've had but people were also totally isolated because there was no means of communicating. You know, there was a, a, a sign on your door saying the plague in this house um, so that nobody would come in and you had no means of, of communicating because you, know, you couldn't go out and nobody would dare to come in and see you and you didn't have you know, telephone, let alone um, you know, Zoom or whatever it may be. So although we've been in a terrible situation, I think we have been lucky to have the technology and as I said earlier, being able to see, and I'm sure JLGB will do this, what, when we're all back to normal, hopefully, what will, you know, how will JLGB virtual be part of JLGB in the future? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we've now got a question from Laura. Hi, lovely to meet you. Hello. Um, hi. Uh, in 2003, you were appointed as Master of Birkbeck University. Uh, can you tell us about what this position entails and what makes Burbeck different to other universities? Yes, of course. I can speak for probably about five hours on that, so I'll try and control myself. Um, but as, uh, as Josh said, introducing us, um, we were and are primarily a university where older people who work during the day, um, but actually also now younger people. You can apply to us through UCAS. You can do your degree in three years and you can study in the evening. So advertising for Birkbeck, very good for 18 year olds who want to start a job and work and study in the evening. One of our 18 year olds said to me, after three years, I will have work experience and university degree. My peers will have only one or the other. Um, so that's, that's what Birkbeck is about. It's about evening study um, and now flexible study. In terms of what I do, um, I write very long strategy documents about Birkbeck, which are 50 pages long. And then when people ask me to summarize them, I say they can be summarized in one word, which is survival, because government funding for evening study, government funding for part time is extremely bad compared to full time funding. And so we fight all the time for improvements in government funding. 
to allow people, for example, if they already have a degree, to get a loan to study for another degree. Let's say you've had a job for 10, 15 years, you've now lost your job because of the virus or for some other reason, you want to retrain in IT or whatever, you can't get a loan to do that if you already have a different um, degree. So I have to spend a lot of my time lobbying people and arguing um, about those sorts of things and making sure that Birkbeck runs even though we don't have as much money as we would like to have. Thank you. Thank you. That sounds sounds quite apt now, especially with the sort of uh, problems we have of, with employment. Um, so exactly, next... Josh, what I'm trying to convince the government of. So in mm. fact, I have a, a, a meeting with the main advisor, a virtual meeting with the main advisor to the Secretary of State um, for Education tomorrow, in which I'm going to tell him that they should be supported retraining and reskilling. Right. So, which I think is what yeah. we need to do. What I have to do though is to stop my stop my phone when I type on it, objecting to the word reskilling. So it doesn't like reskilling and it tries to change it into something else. When you type reskilling about 20 times a day, that's extremely irritating. <laughs> I haven't quite worked out how to stop it thinking that that's a, not a word, because I think it is a word, unless any of you want to tell me it isn't a word. Okay, so we've got a question from Louis next. Hi, Professor. Thank Hello. you. For coming on tonight. Um, my question is, is a part of it's already been answered regarding virtual uh, lectures. Um, so that, that, that I'm not going to speak about. What I wanted to, to ask you was, do you anticipate a reduction in admissions in Burbank due to coronavirus? And how will, uh, how, how will you cope with the funding gap due yeah. to reduction in admissions? Very good, very good question. I mean, and we just heard today that we won a gold award for our recruitment campaign and for how good it is. Um, and our applications are actually up. Um, so they're up particularly um, in undergraduate part-time, particularly in master's students. But we are very aware that many of those applications may disappear. There may be international students who have applied, but will decide that they don't want to come in October. There may well be people who've sat at home, always thought that they might want to apply to do a degree um, and had the time at home to fill out the forms and do everything, who will decide, well, I'm 30, I could do it at 31 or 32. So we are aware that we're very vulnerable um, to that. I think you know we're planning, what we're doing is hoping for the best and expecting the worst. Um, we have reasonable reserves of money, um, so we can cope with a downturn. Um, but also we're trying to emphasize the uniqueness of Birkbeck and this combination of work and study. So for example, if you are a new graduate who's graduating this year, you were offered a job and that job offer has now been withdrawn or deferred or whatever. If you go to another university to do a master's and then somebody offers you a job, you will be faced with a terrible decision in March, April. Do I give up the work that I've done on the masters and take the job? Or do I try to defer the job? Maybe the employer will take somebody else and I finish my masters. At Birkbeck, to give you the propaganda, you can carry on with the masters and you can take the job. So we're trying to emphasize all that, but you're right. There is significant risk that a lot of international students won't come and that some home students will decide, why don't I wait a year till I can have what I want um, you know, in terms of face-to-face -face tuition. Uh, um, Josh, I was wondering if I could ask uh, another question, if possible. Do I have time for another question? Go for it, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, my other question is, uh, it's, it's a controversial question, if, if you don't mind me asking. Regarding the recent events uh, that have obviously been in the press regarding the death of George Floyd and the ripping down of statues, particularly at universities and in other public areas, what, what's your opinion on that? And has Burbeck... Yes. I told them in Birkbeck, I, I told them in Birkbeck that when they put up a statue to me, I want 20 foot iron poles driven into the into my feet of the, in the statue so that the statue can't be toppled. Um, so I think we should ensure ourselves against toppling. Um, I think you know, what is important in all this is, you know, is, is not the gestures that you know, on the one side, the toppling of statues and on the other side, particularly you know, people making university heads making bland statements that you know of course they support all their students and so on what is important is action and we are trying to do our best in Birkbeck to do the best for all our students over 50 percent of our students are BAME students so they reflect the diversity of London and there is you know to be frank with you there's an attainment gap that students who come in from those communities do less well than white students and we have to really understand why that is 
and eliminate that as much as possible. Um, we've also funded in each of our five um, department, five faculties, a PhD student ship which will be restricted to ethnic minority candidates because they're underrepresented in the level of people doing doctoral studies um, and so on. So I think it's what's important to me is that organizations don't say to themselves, yes, we're fine, we can issue a pious statement and it's all fine. You actually need a bit of soul searching to ask yourself, you know, what could we do more to help our community and help our, in our case, our students, but in other cases, the consumers or, or the staff or whatever it may be. Thank you very much. Thank you. It sounds like you've been really thinking about that. Um, so we've got, we've got um, Helen raised her hand, so we'll unmute her and you can ask a question. Hi. Hello. It's not really a question. It's just going back to what you showed earlier, your, um, your cup for shooting. Yes. I just wanted to let you know that... Um, uh, not anymore, but when I was in Liverpool, uh, JLGB, and I uh, had control of the stores at the in, in the office at Liverpool JLGB's office, we did actually have air rifles in the store up until Liverpool Community Centre being destroyed and rebuilt about eight years ago. We still had those air rifles in the stores. Mm. And not that long ago, well, it is actually, when I was a cadet, we did actually do rifle shooting in Liverpool JLGB. Yes. So, I mean, it was just air rifles, but still we did do it. And, and of course, you know, the people who did that before the war, as I showed with the person whose medals I showed, were the sort of leading lights of um, going into the army in the Second World War. Well, ironically, so, you sh the medal you showed, I have of my grandpa's. Right, um, the Africa star. The, my grandpa was in North Africa, yes. and among other places. But he, he also... Um, he also was an officer and a captain in JLGB. Yes. So, so yeah, he, he was very involved, but he, he, he did have those same medals. Yes. Yeah, and they clearly, they, were, that, that's, they, they achieved their ideal, the people who founded JLGB, because their, their idea was, you know, the good Jew and the good Englishman. And I think the people showed that they were good Englishmen in the... Well, I mean, my family, my family's been in JLGB for many, many generations. And the only reason my family actually ended up in Liverpool was because my great grandfather enlisted in the army hmm. and he was sent yeah. to Liverpool to build ships. Yes. So that, that's the whole reason why my family's even there. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. It's been it's been really interesting to sort of hear about the history and the, the footsteps we're walking in. Um, so we've got another question from Elliot. Hi. Hi, hello. Um, yeah. And we spoke a bit earlier about your, how you got into biology and you now being master of Birkbeck. I know along the way you became a professor. Right. I was wondering if you could tell everyone a bit about how you became a professor and what you did as one. Yes. OK. Well, in fact, it's interesting you say that because yesterday I chaired the committee in Birkbeck, which confers the title of professor um, on particular colleagues. So what happens is that you become an academic, usually at the level of a lecturer, and then whatever your subject, whether it's English or biology or um, you know, what a psychology, whatever it may be, you carry out research program, you carry out teaching and so on. And then at some point you put yourself in for promotion to the next level. So one level above lecturer is senior lecturer, then comes something called reader, which in the United States is called associate professor. And then when you've reached a certain level in terms of your research publications, your teaching activities and so on, your administration, um, then you can put in to go to the next level professor. And the quirk of the system is that when you're lecturer, senior lecturer, reader, you don't have a particular title in front of your name other than doctor if you have a PhD, um, but when you get to professor, then you get to call yourself professor. Um, so that happened to me um, a long time ago um, in 1991 when UCL made me a professor. Um, and then gradually I took on bigger and bigger administrative responsibilities in UCL, which eventually prepared me to sort of go on to be um, head of Berkeley. Thank you. Um, we've now got a question from Benjamin. Hello, Professor. Hello, hi. I had a question for you. Because uh, obviously, since the beginning of your career, the industry has changed so much. Uh, you've seen a lot more women coming into science, people of colour. And I was wondering if you think that it's down to like, the schools to make 
like to put forward STEM subjects a lot further and teaching like new subjects like robotics, like we're doing in so many, so many different countries. Do you think that's something that really needs to be pushed forward as an initiative in the UK? I mean, I think I think what needs to be really pushed forward is aspiration. So people need to think, you know, this is something that I can do. And, you know, I think the, the whole issue and coming back to the issue of minorities and so on, the whole issue of having role models is you know, a tremendously important um, thing. I think that was behind the Maccabeans, you know, young people in a particular profession, seeing how high they could go in the law or accountancy or medicine. Um, but as a fantastic line, we had a, we gave a, a fellowship to a black woman writer of creative writing who'd supported creative writing studentships in Birkbeck. And she said in her acceptance speech, if you can't see it, you can't be it. And I think that's a very powerful line that, you know, if you don't see a black person or a Jewish person or whatever it is in a particular role, then you will think that's not for me. And I think it's all about aspiration. You're right. It needs to be done in the schools. But, you know, with my Birkbeck hat on, there will always be people that the schools miss. And those people need to be helped at a later stage. Let me give you one example of that. When there were the London bombings, one of our Birkbeck students was driving the tube train behind the one that was bombed in Edgware Road. And he led his passengers to safety. It was on Sky News and whatever. And the, the spotlight fell on him. And at the time, this guy had, so he'd done a bachelor's degree in the Open University. At the time of the bombing, he was doing a master's degree, would you believe in contemporary politics at Birkbeck? Um, and then he went on to do a doctorate on the subject of how the Nazis used corrupt judges at the beginning of their regime to sort of cover up and legalize what they were doing. So this guy said to me that he left school at 16 with no qualifications. The system failed him completely. You know, it basically said, go and be a, you know, do a menial job. He went off to be a tube driver, which is actually a highly skilled job, of course, but um, he went into the union, he got into local politics, and then he went through the degree system. So this person reached the highest level of qualification that you can get in the university to have a doctorate. And yet, you know, he'd been told at 16, all you can do is, is a job that's a manual labor. You can't do anything that requires intelligence. So we really need to keep saying to people, try to fulfill your potential, whether it's creative writing or whether it's you know, robotics, whatever it may be, people need to be encouraged to, to do that. Thank you. Thank you. That's really quite inspirational. Um, we've got Ricky with our last question from the audience. Hello. Um, Hello. Oh, thanks hi. so much for coming on. Um, it's been a great interview so far. So uh, we really appreciate you coming on. Um, so um, you've been asked lots of questions um, about your career, about the foundation. Um, but actually, I'd like to know, and I think the audience would like to know, what you get up to in your spare time. Um, are you a, a sports fan, a musical fan? Uh, do you binge on Netflix 15 hours a day? Um, what, do you, what do you get up to in your spare time, if you don't mind me okay. asking? Well, I mean, you saw part of my spare time, which was the <laughs> items of JLGB that, you, um, that I showed you. And I spent a lot of my time online looking for those sorts of things and being able to you know, bid in auctions and so on. My wife says that I'm obsessed with it. Um, <laughs> but I also have an 11-year-old son. Um, he is very keen on cricket. So we play cricket in the garden. We've been doing that uh, during the lockdown. Um, and amazingly, he's also very keen in watching Come Dine With Me. Um, so we watch mm. Come Dine, Dine With Me almost every evening. In fact, he's very upset because I, you are interfering with our watching his recordings of Come Dine With Me. This <laughs> evening. So I promised him a double dose tomorrow night because um, he can't have it um, tonight. So I don't know whether he intends to become a chef or a cricketer, um, but we'll see. Um, but, you know, that second <laughs> wall takes up a lot of my time then a lot of that remains goes on the Judaica and then you know, it goes on the family and doing really what they want me to do. I see. OK, well, I, I can I've, I've watched a few Come Dine With Me episodes and, and the narrator very much makes the show. He's hilarious. Um, yes, we only watch couples Come Dine With Me. Oh, OK, fine. I don't know why, but he doesn't like individual Come Dine With Me. We like couples Come Dine With Me. So. Fair enough. Um, <laughs> and do, and, and we have a we have a we have a just a silly tradition uh, with our, with a lot of with our guests. Uh, we often ask them what their favourite musical is because what we try to do is we try to if we can find it um, find a way to uh, play uh, um, your favourite song from that musical um, in the end credits of the show. So do, do you have a favourite musical yes, by any chance? Absolutely, I have a favourite musical slash play slash film, which is the producers. 
Um, ah. I don't know if you know, with Zero Mostel, um, you know, looking at um, you know, this show that has to be a flop and it doesn't turn out to be a flop, it turns out to be a huge success and they end <laughs> up in prison because they've offered you know, 50% to one person, 100% to another. And of course, the song is Springtime for Hitler. Of course. So if you can find that, then um, we well, if you play that. We can't make any promises, well. but if we can, you'll, what you'll find is that uh, when the show finishes, uh, suddenly your favourite song may appear, um, but if we can't find it, then uh, it's only because we haven't been able to find it. But um, thank you very much. Uh, we're really enjoying it. I'm going to get. I'm going to hand back to Josh now, who's got his last few questions. But thanks. And so let much, let me recommend the producers to all those who are sort of tuned in. It is a fabulous film, and you know, it's it's a real example of carryover of Yiddish humour because Mostel was a great mm -hmm. Yiddish actor um, into sort of Hollywood and, and Hollywood made film, which actually really is a Yiddish film in English. And I, I second that recommendation. Thanks so much, David. Thank you. I'm going to have a look at that afterwards. Sounds like it's worth a watch. Um, so we've got a few more questions, if you don't mind. Absolutely. Um, so the Wall Foundation provides an incredible amount of resources to the Jewish community, um, including you mentioned the Campus for Jewish Care um, and the site of Ilford Jewish Primary School. Um, it also provided JLGB with the original funding for our Evolve initiative so that um, that so many of us have taken part in. What excited um, what excited you to sort of invest or what excited you to invest on behalf of the foundation in JLGB and the Evolve platform? Yes. OK, well, I can tell you one answer, of course, is that your president, Michael Levy, Lord Levy, is very persuasive. Um, and so he's very hard to say no to. You can see his theme running through Jewish care and JLGB. Um, but you know, on a more serious note, I really like this idea of people of, of your age volunteering in charities, because I think, you know, it gives you experience of volunteering. But also in 10 years time, 15 years time, where maybe you're successful in your profession or your business, you will naturally have a link to that charity and you'll want to give back to that charity. Maybe you'll want to go on the, be a trustee of that charity or you'll want to give money to that charity. And I think, you know, there's always a problem. My mother is president, life president of Youth Aliyah Child Rescue. And I always saw this problem. How do you get new young people to come in? And, you know, if you go and volunteer in a charity, when you look around when you're a bit older and say, I've got a bit of spare income, I've got a bit of spare time, I'd like to give back, you'll probably go first to that charity rather than thinking, oh, there's nothing that really interests me. So I thought it was a great example of a project that works now for the people who are doing it, but actually lays a legacy for 10, 20 years time when you're hopefully, you know, substantial people who can give back. All, almost sort of building a generation of philanthropists. Absolutely, absolutely. Very, that's very important. Um, so sort of looking forward again, um, what's next for you? What does the future hold in store? You've overseen a generation of genetic research and supported the community for many years. What do you hope your own legacy to be? I, I know you talked about the statue. Yes, I mean, I think, well, the first thing is Birkbeck is 200 years old in 2023. So that is a tremendous sort of landmark. I mean, not many institutions get to 200 years. Um, you know, you ask actually about Colonel Goldsmith or somebody asked about Colonel Goldsmith and the JLGB. You know, George Birkbeck was the founder of Birkbeck in 1823. If he came back today, he would recognize what we were doing. So he wouldn't understand about Zoom and online and you know, whatever, but he would understand about working people studying in a way that they have always, you know, that they need. And that is something it was founded for. So it's great for me to take it to the you know, through to 2023. I want to carry on the World Foundation celebrated 50 years a couple of years ago. Um, and you know, we are building for the future on what we call the World Legacy. Um, and maybe when I've retired, you know, my ultimate boring task is actually to catalogue my library, which, you know, people keep saying to me, do you have a library catalogue? Do you know what you have? Yes. Do I have a library catalogue? No. So maybe spending a bit of time doing that. I did intend to do that during lockdown, but actually three months in, I haven't found one moment to do that yet. <laughs> we've, all, we've almost sort of become too flexible. You're still having to work. Well, I think also play cricket. You know, every time I have a little gap, my son says, oh, and I've got a lunchtime now. I've got playtime now. I want to go out and you know, play cricket. So it keeps me. A bit okay. So the, these are unprecedented times um, and the effects, there's no doubt the effects of COVID will be with us for some time to come. Um, 
but what gives you hope for the future and what positives do you think will come out of this strange time? I think, you know, and I think I said a little bit of this earlier, we will learn more about how to operate in a, in a better manner. So one of the things, for example, the World, Found, World Foundation funds the World Clean Growth Initiative, which is intended to promote collaboration between Britain and Israel in clean growth in energy and so on. Um, and, you know, we had what started off as a very depressing meeting about two months ago, in which everybody was saying, well, it's all about funding collaboration. It's about people flying from Britain to Israel you know, to work together. It's about setting up a workshop where British scientists can meet Israeli scientists in London, in Tel Aviv or whatever. And I said, actually, this is a clean growth initiative. You know, we ought to be able to work out ways of doing this that don't involve burning huge amounts of carbon and flying on planes. And I think we are realizing that a lot of the things that we thought were absolutely essential, you know, I have to sit in the same room as that person and 600 other people, you know, at a conference about molecular genetics are simply not true. That, you know, very many things, not everything, very many things can be done online. You know, very difficult meetings, I find, often benefit from, you know, you share a cup of coffee before you get down to fighting it out. Um, you know, there are things like that where you, you're meeting in a room and it's, it's better in normal times. But I think we will find that you know, we don't need to fly around the world. I mean, I'll give you another example. We fund um, a thing called Educating for Impact, which is about Jewish schools in small communities in Leeds. I don't know if there's anybody from Leeds, but also in, in centres all the way around Europe. Last year, we had a really inspirational conference in Warsaw. Lord Sachs addressed us. It was hugely inspirational. On Monday evening, I chaired a session with Lord Sachs, a virtual session with 100 people in 20 different countries. It was, if anything, even more inspirational. So, you know, and it was done by Zoom and people were, you know, people who might not have traveled, we were going to have it in Prague, people who might not have traveled to Prague were able to participate because it's online and so on. So I think mm -hmm. we'll learn a lot of those lessons that, you know, there'll be a bit that we'll still need to do in the old way, but there'll be a lot that we can do in a different way. Okay, thank you. That's really, really interesting to hear. Um, and so thank you. You've, we've had some really interesting questions and even more interesting answers. Um, but Finally, we always ask our guests to nominate and ask another celebrity or community leader to be a future guest on our programme and sort of help entertain children and young people stuck at home and hopefully educate them as well. Um, if you've enjoyed tonight's experience, who would you like to sort of nominate? Um, I was going to nominate Michael Levy, but I presume you've had Michael Lord Levy um, already um, as your president. But if you haven't, you should have him. Um, and someone else who I, I think I would nominate in the Jewish care, thinking about Jewish care, is the chief executive of Jewish care, Daniel Carmel Brown, who I think has had an enormous okay. role to play. You know, we all know what's happened in the care homes. Jewish care, I think, has protected its care homes a lot better than many other organizations. You might want to bring him, him on. So bring on somebody from a sort of sister charity, if you like, Jewish care, and really try to understand what challenges they've faced, you know, issues like patients being sent home from hospital who are clearly positive, what do you do about bringing them into your, you know, your care home and potentially infecting other people while caring for them and so on. So that might be, might be a bit depressing, but it, I think it's also something for the future, how do care homes operate in the future and so on. So yeah. Think about okay. that. Well, thank you very much. Um, thank you, David, for joining us this thank evening. Thank you. It's, it's for... been very, very enjoyable to to talk to you all and, and you know, hear your views and questions. So thank you. That's good. I'm, I'm pleased to hear it. Um, Are we going to get our song now? That's the question. Have you we'll found see, the song? We'll see. We'll see. But um, <laughs> thank you for inspiring us all. We've really loved hearing your fascinating career, your experiences, and we are so grateful for the work you continue to do for our community. Um, we'd also like to take this opportunity to thank you for your support of JLGB and the community for so many years and for helping turn our Evolve initiative into reality. You've been fundamental in helping us support our children and vulnerable people before and during lockdown. And we want to make sure you know that you will always have our gratitude and appreciation. Stay safe and take care, and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. And you stay safe as well, and carry on with your great work for JLGB, all of you. Thank you. Thank you. And that's it. Thank you to everyone for tuning in this evening and yet again being part of history. A quick reminder that we're looking for everyone to get involved. If you have a special skill and would like to teach us on JLGB Virtual, please email virtual at jlgb.org to get involved. And we will be back on tomorrow. We will be doing more arts and crafts with Rachel 
doing another amazing navigation skills club with Rory before talking to TV producer Ben Winston. Until then, keep well and good night.